contributions. The religious community has continued to provide spiritual nourishment within the stipulated guidelines, and for the most part, you, Kenyans, have joined the government in the fight against coronavirus. And I thank you. The fight might be housed in the Ministry of Health, but it is one that belongs to each one of us. In Kenya, in the East African region, in Africa as a continent, and indeed the globe. Fellow Kenyans, a few days ago, the World Health Organization warned that despite the seemingly slow pace of infections in Africa, the number of coronavirus cases could surge from just thousands to 10 million within three to six months. While this is a projection, it might as well be the reality in the coming days. Consider that this past week alone, we have seen significant changes of infections in our own neighborhood, where the COVID-19 cases in Somalia have multiplied ninefold in a single week, from 26 cases on April 13th to 237 by yesterday. In our neighboring Tanzania, the numbers have swollen sevenfold from 32 cases to 254 within the same period. These developments concern us. They might translate into frightening reality for the Horn of Africa. While what we are learning is that this virus transmits silently. Initially, it may move at a slow pace, but as we have also seen in countries such as Spain and Italy, it takes on such frantic speed that even the most developed of nations cannot catch up with it. Between March 18th and 25th, a span of one week, the cases in Spain grew fivefold from 11,741 to 50,019. Given these realities, the general sentiment of comfort we are witnessing is severely misplaced. When we as a nation are complacent with a few officials exploiting this pandemic for personal gain, or conversely, the idea that we can break curfews and not suffer any ramifications, then we know that we are heading in the wrong direction. And indeed, there is nothing to celebrate when runaway impunity takes place at the risk of all of us. As a government, our planning and actions are informed by global trends and our own analysis. A slight lapse in behavior, like the ones we have witnessed in the last few days, could roll back the gains we have made so far and by, 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 by implication, the destiny of our nation. The days when everything was left to the government are long gone. This disease is now calling for our total and divided commitment and unity. While I appreciate and acknowledge the cooperation by many, many Kenyans, I must say that there are a few Kenyans who deliberately rebuke the efforts that we have put in place to contain the spread of the virus. Our daily update briefings have served to rally Kenyans to their individual responsibilities, while at the same time painting the picture of our situation. And this is not just in Kenya. It is a global practice today. It is therefore unfortunate that some naysayers have dismissed our data briefings as mere daily ledgers. Elsewhere, the disease has thrived on similar cloud of silence and ignorance. 
and we are which we are being pushed to adopt. We refuse to sit back, and we will continue to inform Kenyans of our situation and measures they need to continuously take in order to flatten our curve. Regarding mass testing, the exercise is ongoing, targeting high-risk areas, which include healthcare workers. We, are, we currently have 25,000 testing kits which have been deployed for this activity. Globally, every country is working on testing targets or have fallen short of these targets because of global disruption of supplies. Our plan is to conduct 250,000 tests by the end of June. However, these 250,000 will not match our population. Hence, we are collaborating with our development partners to lamp up our surveillance testing mechanisms. The plan entails community-based surveillance, hospital-based surveillance, and population-based surveillance. For the community-based surveillance, we are working at about 100,000 households. For the hospital-based surveillance, we have mapped up 20 hospitals in 16 regions. All this is being done under an overarching five-year public health security framework that we have worked out. Our coronavirus response is therefore nested on this policy. The challenge we have over and above corona is to keep an eye on the other health care challenges. I therefore want to call on all counties to ensure continuity of health services without losing sight of the corona epidemic. We should therefore be prepared in the coming days to share our county health service delivery scorecards. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Kenyans, in times such as this, we have to be alive to the effect that COVID-19 management measures, what these measures have had on our people. We are particularly concerned about mental health. Towards this end, we have established a psychiatric and psychological care help framework over this period. If you feel distressed and needing counseling or psychological care, please call 1199 and you will be attended to. For any inquiries on continuity of psychological care or psychiatric emergencies or crisis, please call our hotline which will be distributed to the media. Today, we have looked at the unfolding situation in Mandera County. So far, the county has eight cases, the latest being two cases of urban refugees. Now, this is a dangerous situation because as you are well aware, Mandela has a lot of, is, is, a, corner, is a corner county with neighbors on two sides and is also affected by travel from uh, other parts of the country. Therefore, as part of the containment measures, the government has today restrict, directed restriction of movement into and out of Mandera County. The county, therefore, becomes the fifth county where movement has been restricted. Today, having tested 707 samples, we have seven persons who have tested positive to the disease. Those being Kenyans as a whole. We don't have any foreigners in those figures. And I would like to state, kama vile nilisema, hii ugonjwa, si ugonjwa ya serikali, hii ni ugonjwa wa kila mtu. Na kama mjuavyo, kuna wale ambao hawaogopi. Na yule ambao haogopi, atakuja kuogopa. Kwa sababu, hii ugonjwa haina tajiri. 
haishagui tajiri, haishagui kijana, haishagui yoyote. Kila mtu, kila mtu anaweza kushikwa na hii ugonjwa. Kwa hivyo sisi tunasema wale ambao wale ambao wanasaidia sisi sana ni wale ambao wanafuata sheria ile tumetoa mipango ile tumetoa hao ndio wanasaidia sisi kama wa Kenya lakini mjua ya kwamba wale ambao hawafuati wale ambao mnaona wakiruka wakitoka kwa quarantine facilities hao watu ni kusema wanataka kutoka huko waingie vijijini wapeleke ugonjwa huko vijijini ukiona mtu akiruka ni vile 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 mnajua wale wengine walifanya mnajua kuna watu walienda mazichi upande wa malindi kule kilifi ugonjwa ukaanza wengine wakaenda mikutano ugonjwa ukaanza hapa isili tulikuwa na imam alikuwa hajui yeye ni mgonjwa akaja akafariki wale ambao walikuwa na yeye karibu wamepata hii ugonjwa Kawangware iko watu wengi walianza na mtu mmoja wakaenda tatu wakaenda wengine wengine wawili na tunaen, na tunaendelea tunaendelea kufanya testing huko tuone ni wangapi pengine ukiangalia kule Mombasa upande wa KPA vile 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 hii ugonjwa inaendelea inaendelea kuchika watu kwa hivyo jameni mimi ningewasihi wa Kenya ningewasihi wa Kenya tusije tukasikiliza wale ambao ni lazima waseme mambo mambaya mambo maovu kwa wale ambao wanafanya hii kazi kwa mimi mwenyewe kwa wale wengine msije mkasikiza hao watu mimi ningewasihi tuendelee kusikia vile serikali inasema kwa sababu hii kazi ya kupigana na hii virusi si kazi yetu kama serikali hii ni kazi ya kila mkenya kila mkenya na wewe ukijisikia ukiona kama sio wewe ukiona kama hii si kazi yako basi wewe umeanza kukosea wakati unasikia wewe si hiyo sio kazi yako umeanza kukosea kwa sababu hii ni kazi yako kwa sababu gani kwa sababu hii ni ugonjwa wetu kwa sababu gani kwa sababu hii ugonjwa inaweza shika wewe na ikishika wewe basi wewe utalete hiyo ugonjwa kwangu na kwa yule mwingine asanteni sana And then to the DG, uh, there is a, a drug that has been used across the world to treat especially severe cases of COVID-19, hydroxyl chloroquine, and uh, uh, research has also shown that... Shemtai, I don't, think, I don't think we had a question. Uh, the uh, one for the DG? Yes, I was just getting started. Uh, to the DG, uh, there is a drug that is being used across the world to, to treat severe cases of COVID-19, hydroxyl chloroquine, and the uh, research has shown that it has some adverse effects, especially on people who have heart problems. Probably here in the country, is there a drug regimen that is being used especially for those who have severe cases of COVID, uh, uh, having other illnesses that they are suffering from? Uh, Nancy Okwari from CBC. Uh, my question is on the number of people who have succumbed to COVID-19. They are 14. And uh, do we have any foreign nationals among those 14? And if yes, how is the government handling the bodies, given that they should be disposed of as soon as possible? I think uh, for me, I am going to respond to the issue of uh, KMTC briefly. I think more, most of those questions were uh, technical questions that uh, uh, Dr. Amoth can answer. On KMTC, and by the way, it is not just KMTC. Le let, me, let me explain. It is not just in KMTC that people have uh, escaped from um, 
uh, from quarantine. In fact, Mandela was the first place where people escaped from quarantine. And I would like to agree that it is not possible for people to simply walk out of an institution that has got security forces, that has got uh, uh, people charged with the, with the responsibility of ensuring that people stay within the quarantine facilities. But more importantly, it is very difficult to fathom how an individual who knows very well, they are not in prison. Quarantine facilities are not prison facilities. You have been kept there or you have been, you have been quarantined so that you can protect yourself and you can protect those people around you. So those of you out there, those Kenyans who know of an individual who was in quarantine, and you know them, who was in quarantine, who is now proposing that you should be living normally with them. An individual who you are aware, because there were even videos, who you are aware jumped the fence at KMTC, jumped the wall at KMTC, and is now with you. That individual is going to cost you very, very highly. That individual could end up killing your child. It is therefore imperative and important that you call the police and let them know that individual XYZ was in quarantine and is now hiding in house number 10 or house number 12 at Umoja or Bruburu or, or, or wherever else. So my mind is to urge people that, and this is, what, this is why we have been talking about this being our own responsibility. It is, not a, it is not for the police to go searching for this person, which they will and which they are. They have probably been arrested already. I don't know as I speak. But that's not the point. The point is that you cannot have uh, 47 million policemen following 47 million Kenyans. People need to police themselves in a matter such as this one. Therefore, my, I, I would urge, I would urge that those people surrender themselves back to uh, the quarantine facility because if they do not surrender themselves back, then they render themselves to all kinds of things, including, including being mobbed by people, you know, and taken there by force. And, we are, and, and, and therefore, they should not expose themselves to that kind of uh, possibility. I think it is enlightened self-interest for them to report back to the quarantine uh, facility. But in addition to those ones, are also those ones who, as you have been seeing in the social media, entertain themselves in places that they are not supposed to. And the irony of it is that within a couple of days of, those, of that entertainment, you hear of a positive case. Therefore, let me just again appeal to Kenyans and to inform you as follows, we can defeat this disease. We do not have to multiply four or five times like the neighborhood and the world is doing. If we exercise self-discipline, if you become your brother's keeper, and I become my brother's keeper, and by that I mean both positively and negatively, where if one, where we help each other, where we assist each other, where we try and provide for each other. But the flip side of it is that we are where we also report each other when people do not do what they are supposed to do. So once again, we urge caution, we preach hope, but we also preach responsibility. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Chemutai asked about the use of hydrochloroquine and its safety profile. Remember, hydrochloroquine and chloroquine are closely related compounds and had been used before, and they are even continue to be used, for example, for rheumatoid arthritis and other immunological conditions which require control. Our case management team 
have developed proper guidelines on the use of chloroquine, taking into consideration existing medical conditions. So we shall be able to adequately titrate the dose of chloroquine. Indeed, if you have a heart problem, in which case chloroquine could interfere with your cardiac rhythm and cause problems. And as doctors, we know how to do that and we do it very well. But I also want also to highlight that it's not only chloroquine that is being in use. Over and over again, we have reported other compounds that have been used world over, some with very good results. However, one of the limiting factors has been the limited number of cases studied. For example, there's a new drug called Remdesivir that has been used in the United States with very, very good effects, but on a small select population of people. And there are many other compounds, Avigan, Caletra, Interferon, and all drugs, including Panadol, has adverse effects and must be used within a proper dosing regimen. And this will apply for treatment of COVID if we adapt use of chloroquine and hydrochloroquine as one of the molecules in treatment of severe COVID disease. In terms of in terms of, of uh, bodies of foreign nationals, I'm pleased to inform you that foreign nationals have done very well. We have had a, a Congolese couple who were discharged the other day. There's a gentleman from Comoros who has been discharged from the treatment center, another one from Cameroon, and another one from Pakistan. So they have done well, but we also have standard guidelines that we have adapted from the World Health Organization and customized to our local needs for internment of bodies. So far, it's only one foreign national who passed on at Kenyatta National Hospital. And in liaison with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we quickly reached out to the embassy and uh, we got a letter of authority from the relatives of this individual. And the individual was buried in a cemetery, I think, in, uh, in Nairobi. So foreign nationals is only one who has passed on. Very many of them have done very well they have been discharged, awaiting just clearance of travel clearance to be able to go back to their respective countries. Thank you.